Good morning and welcome to, welcome to Coping with COVID. I'm Becky Demetia, your Bereavement Coordinator from Talbot Hospice. And we're gonna continue our series today. Um, like last week, we are gonna do an interview. Um, actually, we're gonna have interviews this entire month. Um, so we're gonna be talking about different topics. Today, I have um, my very sweet and uh, friend and colleague, Brianne Carball. Um, we are gonna talk about grief and funerals and specifically about losing a loved one. Um, on hospice care, um, but this can extend to the death of a loved one outside of hospice. Um, but we wanted to definitely um, talk about this because this is something that is um, on the hearts and the minds of a lot of our hospice families because they're actively doing this. We are having to think of very unique and creative ways um, while we're stay-at-home orders and minimal social, minimal crowds and social distancing. Um, so welcome, Brianne. I want you just to introduce yourself a little and tell us about you, and then we'll kind of dig into our topic. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, again, my name is Brianne Carball. I'm a bereavement counselor with Talbot Hospice, um, and I think the best thing to say is that with everything changing and with COVID-19 happening, um, the community aspect is so important. So it's it's fun to watch how um, socially distant people are finding ways to still stay connected with everyone, especially when they're um, grieving and after they've lost a loved one. So uh, I think it's important that we're here talking about it. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. No, and I think, you know, I think it's timely because um, as we've been in this stay at home or safer at home order longer, we've had to become even more creative. Um, and, you know, some families are doing okay and some families are struggling. And so definitely want to talk about both sides of the, I call it the pendulum because um, it's ever moving. Um, and some days we might be feeling great and fine and the next day we might not feeling fine at all. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the creative ways that people are doing funerals. Um, I think it's been fascinating to kind of hear how families are doing it. Different funeral homes are different having ideas. Churches are doing ideas. Um, so Brianne, you are more on the front line than I am. You are actively um, connected with our families, where am I? Um, I'm doing more of the back end things. I'm still connected with families, but not as much. So kind of share with us, with, um, what are some ways you're hearing that people are doing funerals and memorial services differently? Yeah, so... The, it's really fun to watch how creative people are getting with everything going on. Um, the, the few people I have talked to, a lot of um, family members are sort of putting off some of their, their celebrations when they can have a bigger time or a bigger celebration. Um, but then there's others who are doing like Zoom grief group. There was a great, or I'm sorry, a Zoom um, funeral. There was a great one where uh, they set it up so that the urn could be in the center and the family members Zoom videos were around it. Um, I love that. That's and it awesome. Was, yeah, it was a great way to sort of celebrate them. Um, there are funeral homes that are doing like almost drive-by funerals where people stay in the parking lot, stay in your own car, and then um, they can sort of have like photos set up and have music playing and people can kind of drive by and give their respects. Um, mm -hmm. As well as some funerals are even doing, and this, this is a little more time consuming, where they allow family members of like groups of three or four to come in, um, visit with their, their loved one, say goodbye. Then the funeral home will actually sanitize like doorknobs in the area really quickly before they let the next group in. That is a very time consuming and more expensive option. Yeah. Um, but it is nice that funeral homes and churches are finding different mm -hmm. different ways to kind of stay connected there's there's a church service um, i think today where um you can actually just log on that on on their website and watch the funeral um or watch the celebration of life um and anyone can so it, it we are finding ways to celebrate the life of of our loved ones um there is sort of an element that unfortunately is still missed and i think that that being next to someone and hugging someone is something we do definitely miss, but we are finding ways to still stay connected, which um, is important. I love that. I know. And it's, you know, um, I also heard um, there was a funeral around me um, and uh, they posted that they were going to do kind of more of a traditional uh, viewing or wake. Um, they were going to have people stand in line with their masks and social distance and kind of just 
um, walk, do like a walk by so nobody would be touching anybody, but they would have an opportunity to, to view their loved one. Um, and so there was still that traditional element to it, but it was very much a, a lined six feet mask, you know, please, please, you know, refrain from touching as much as you can. And, um, and so, but you're right. I think this is allowing families and funeral homes and churches to dig deep and, you know, what kind of service um, would the loved one want? Um, and what would, do we want? Um, you know, but you're right. And then I think you, I think you said this, um, is that some families are just delaying because the thought of having a service without everyone there or having to limit the size, is just, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not what they want. Um, we actually had a staff member at Talbot um, whose loved one died. And, um, you know, part of them was okay with delaying the service. Um, but we, this person and I talked about how um, there's still that sense of closure. Finality is, is kind of affecting her grief. Okay. And I thought that was so important. And I never, you know, you know, sometimes you just don't connect dots until somebody's sharing something with you. And that made perfect sense to me. And not that, I mean, you and I know that you don't get closure from a funeral, but there is a sense of finality. It allows your logical brain to say, okay, they really are gone. And now we're going to grieve. Our heart's going to kind of take over. And so for her, it, she was struggling with that piece. She obviously knows her loved one is gone and has died. But not having that ritual mm -hmm. um, really is affecting her grief. And so I kind of want to kind of um, morph into talking about how are people grieving? You know, you and I um, subscribe to the newer grief theory that there, there is not stages. Grief is not linear. It's not nice and neat in a little package. You don't check off any boxes. Um, but you can very much experience all these emotions at the same time. So if you took the stages of, of stages of grief and you put them on a paper and you looked at them, um, chances are at some point in your grief, you're going to experience all of them at the same time. Sometimes and, the what's that? Sometimes on the same day. Right. Or the same minute. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah it happens. Right. And so, um, so I kind of want to talk about how we are all grieving differently. Like that has not changed, but how, um, how are people kind of grieving in the midst of this COVID, not being with their families? And you, because you have a lot more connections, I want to kind of talk to you and pick your brain about what are, what are people sharing with you about their grief now? I think, I think you made a really good point with um, that, not necessarily closure, because we know that you never, grieving is never done. Um, years later, you will still grieve and miss and, you know, want your loved one. But there's a few families I've worked with, particularly the more long distant family members that aren't so local in this area. Um, they might be in Virginia or all around America, actually. It could be uh, North Carolina. And just so they're, they're they normally would have traveled for a funeral or traveled for a little bit of that cel celebration of life or that family community. Uh, and they're not. And there's a difference between like your, your heart and your head, they're not connecting. And you're wondering, um, I know they are logically, I know that my loved one is dead, but I still almost feel like I can pick up the phone and just call them or I can, cause I, cause I'm not around them. I'm not surrounded by them or their memory or the fact that they are gone. Um, and there is sort of that disconnect. And I think something like a ritual of funerals, um, can kind of help with that on the same on the same token of that is that that can impact your grief because you're not necessarily getting um i i don't I, I agree with you i'm not so sure about closure the word closure um but you're not necessarily getting the time with your family to sort of accept the death uh, on the same basis right now and i think that that can kind of delay some some of your grief reactions and sort of um I'm not sure what I was going with that, with that. Um, but well, and right, and the word closure was her her word, and 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 you're right. You know, there's no finish line to this, and there's no checkered flag to our grief. Um, but having rituals, having rituals that we um, look look to, um, you know, especially just kind of giving your family hugs and saying your goodbyes together as a family. Um, yeah, closure is not the right word. I was using that because it was hers. But there is something to be said for that milestone yes. in your grief journey because you're, you're, 
you know, it, it does something to us and our grief process. Um, I want to talk about too how various ways um, you and I have talked in conversation um, about how some people are really feeling isolated and then others are actually appreciating the isolation because of, of, um, because of their grieving style. So talk to me, kind of tell me kind of your experience with these families and what you're hearing. It's interesting because some people are feeling very, very isolated and they want to be surrounded by their loved ones or they, they don't know why um, people aren't visiting them or checking in or making house calls um, because of, of, of COVID. And they understand the logical reason as to why people aren't visiting, but they are still missing. And they're like, while the phone calls are nice, um, it's not the same. And Another element is Zoom calls in general, while can bring you connected, can be quite emotionally draining, especially if you don't know the technology. And even if you do, that can in and of itself be quite, quite draining. So uh, the, just the act of sometimes listening to someone in the same room is nice and just sitting and having a cup of tea can be. So there are things that people really miss by not being able to kind of grieve in a society. But then the interesting thing is I've talked to a couple of other people who are very um, on the opposite side of that. And they said they're never going to be thankful for the coronavirus or, or the COVID-19. They, um, they're not thankful that this virus happened, but they're thankful that for the time it sort of allowed them to grieve alone. And that isolation almost helped their grief because they are more internal grievers and they're able to look at the situation and think, I need to grieve by myself before I can grieve in a community. Um, and it allowed that time uh, to be alone. So in a way, they almost felt like they could take care of themselves. They didn't necessarily have to get up and go to work every day if they were working from home or, or um, and I think that that is important also to note that people are going to experience this grief differently, especially involved with this isolation. And some people are going to gain a lot from it. Some people are not, are going to struggle. Yeah. Absolutely. I think, you know, I think that's so true. And what I tell, and I'm sure you, you say something similar when I'm with people and we're talking about their grief, you know, um, and you mentioned this, we grieve, we grieve within our personalities. If we are a naturally extroverted person, this Corona is going to knock us through a loop because we're not going to be able to go out and get hugs and see people and, and get our needs, our extroverted needs met. But if we're introverted and we are naturally reclusive when we're stressed or we go within ourselves and we are, you know, self-reflective and that is how we process, then yeah, this is a golden opportunity to kind of allow the world because when we lose somebody important, most of the time, um, our friends and our family want to reach out to us and they want to come and they want to give us hugs. But depending on how we process, that might not be appropriate right that minute. Um, so it's all about perspective. And I love that. And I think, you know, one of the themes of these videos is, you know, we're still finding hope. We're finding hope in the midst of the crazy, in the midst of the, the chaos. Um, but it's all about perspective and silver linings. And not that that comes every day, you know, and I'm not delusional. I'm not saying that, you know, you have to find happy every day, but finding what works for you and being okay with that. Like, like you said, these people are not happy that COVID yeah. has happened. They're appreciative of the opportunity that they can grieve in their own way. Mm -hmm. And so that's beautiful. I think that's beautiful. Um, Sorry. No, go ahead. I always, um, and, and everyone will grieve a little bit differently, but I do like the idea of there's two main camps almost of, of grieving and it's a spectrum um, of the, in, the difference between intuitive and instrumental grievers. Um, the intuitives are very, um, they like to think it through with themselves as well as express it to the community. Um, they're talkers. I'm an intuitive griever. They're, they're taught, we express, we share. Um, I grieve by hugs and by being with people while an instrumental grievers are more um they grieve by doing and they they will um plan the funeral they will put their grief into something else they're normally quite creative with um like my my partner's a music musician and he will grieve by making songs or he will grieve by expressing his um grief through art and not necessarily talking about it um but he will grieve in a so it, it's good to acknowledge that some people will be more expressive with their grief while other people will 
um, process it by painting or process it by taking on long walks by themselves or, or just sitting and kind of contemplating by themselves. And I think it's okay to acknowledge both sides. Absolutely. And you know, one of the things that comes up um, that has come up for, for me and um, especially sitting with people individually on the 101 is, you know, when they are not fully emotional or they're not, it's not that they're emotional. Let me rephrase that. When they are not uh, fully expressive with their emotions, they're not tearful or they're not crying or, you know, they're more of that. Well, I got a to-do list and this is how I'm processing, just like you're talking about that can kind of upset them because if they have a sibling or another family member who is more of the expressive and they're, you know, talking about it and talking about it and crying about it. And then you get this person going, no, I mean, I mean, I feel sad, but I am not seeing that. Um, so I think, you know, I think that sometimes makes us when we're grieving, you know, we want to feel normal. We want to feel like we're not crazy. And so when we're not doing what everybody else is doing, like if we're not a crier and we, you know, we go into ourselves and, you know, people are like, oh my God, you're by yourself. Well, yeah, it's kind of how I've always been. And so if we're not doing it like the standard, it can kind of cause some angst. Um, and so that's why I wanted to talk about this with you too, so that whoever's watching, however you're grieving, um, and like Brianne and both I, we both said, it's a, it's a pendulum, it's a spectrum. Um, and even if you are in one side of the camp, you, you move through this, you know, that you'll be in different, um, I don't like the word stages, but you'll be in different parts of your grief, yeah. um, different seasons of your grief. And you might feel that one way of coping, like maybe you aren't necessarily an artistic person, but you're kind of more, you know, you, you want to journal or you just want to put your, put your thoughts on paper, but that's not historically you, but that feels like that's something you want to do. And you do that. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that we can't be outside of our comfort zones or our natural way of doing things. Um, but we do, we grieve within how we're wired and we're all wired different. And that's what makes us beautiful. Um, you know, grieving naturally makes us vulnerable and mm -hmm. fragile. Mm -hmm. And when I say the word fragile, people often get uncomfortable and they get, you can see them shift in their seats and fragile is not weak. When, when we are talking about fragility and grief, we're talking about the fact that it doesn't take much to make us feel like we're crumbling inside. Even if we're a stone wall, you know, most of us are feeling things within ourselves. So even if we're not out, outwardly expressing that, when we're grieving, especially in the early parts of grief, we're fragile. You know, we don't want to be around a lot of people. We don't really want to talk about it. Like we're still trying to process. And so don't make me talk about it a lot. And it makes us vulnerable because everyone knows, or most of our family and friends know that this person died. And so it kind of puts us in a spotlight. And so I just wanted to kind of validate and normalize that for, for the grievers out there. When I say fragile, I don't mean weak. And tears are not a sign of weakness. Crying is not a sign of weakness. Grieving is not a sign of weakness. And actually, the more you allow yourself to naturally feel and process and um, just take um, space in your mind and your heart, actually, the stronger you're going to be because then you are taking control of your emotions and you're, you are aware of what you're feeling. Um, but so Brie, on that vein of the vulnerability vein, um, um, I know that people share that with you in the private conversations about, you know, I, I want to reach out to you because I don't want to burden my family. So tell me some things that families are saying to you to kind of like process this vulnerability and kind of the spotlight that they're, they're experiencing. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it, it is hard around families. Um, you don't necessarily, like you said, grieve the same way. Um, someone will sometimes expect, like, why, why aren't you expressing it the same way? And that's not, mm -hmm. not to say that you don't grieve, or that you're not grieving. You just might not be experiencing it um, mm -hmm. or expressing it. I think one thing that's also important is healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, making, making your experiences known to your family, to your loved one. Explain, mm -hmm. I am grieving, but this is how and I need a moment alone, or I need, or I need a moment where I want to be surrounded. I need you to call me or any, I think sort of setting schedules is also can be helpful, especially if you, if you live off of a schedule setting times where you can um, say, go ahead and give me a call, give me a zoom call at this time. Um, and then we can, we can openly talk. And then the rest of the times I need my time alone. I need my time apart. Um, and it, I think it's important to, uh, acknowledge what what your needs are um, yeah. 
even even if those who love you the most don't necessarily do it the same way mm -hmm. it is it's still important because they're still gonna love you regardless as to um how you're expressing yourself and i think sometimes right. verbalizing it helps it does and you know and i you know and doing the family groups and things you know families talk about that well i don't want to hurt that person's feeling because they're just trying to help well having conversation isn't going to hurt their feelings especially if you're coming out a way of hey i love you and i know you love me and we want to help but this is this is kind of what i need right now and i think it's you know communication is important in all aspects of life the yeah. more we can communicate and share and and ask and and tell it, it just helps make things smoother and you know does that mean that people's feathers aren't going to be ruffled no because sometimes you know if we're all grieving the same person we're just that we are all grieving the same person. Yeah. And so, um, especially for siblings, like one of the interesting phenomenons doing this work for as long as I've been doing it, which is crazy long, um, is sibling groups, um, not necessarily children siblings, but adult siblings. You know, one of the things I tell families all the time is you are gonna be different than your siblings. You already are, you already have been, and now you're all gonna be grieving this person and you're gonna be grieving this, person in different ways, different memories, different experiences, um, different ups and downs. And so I always tell families, okay, so this is where I want you to set the bar. I want you to set it super low. And I want you to know that you guys will never be grieving the same way ever, mm -hmm. period. Like it's, it's never going to happen. You guys are going to be on different pages of your grief. And so if you know that out the gate, you know, um, that, you know, okay, mom, maybe mom's a stoic one and she's the strong one, right? And she's going to be the, the stone wall and we're not going to see her cry. Well, don't expect her. To, if you've never seen mom cry, you might not see mom cry. Meanwhile, you're going to have the bossy sibling over here and the organized sibling and the, the quiet, submissive sibling. I don't have one of those. That sounds nice. Um, <laughs> but you're going to have all these roles, right? Like we're all going to fall into our roles. We're all going to fall into our personalities. And our grief is going to be reflective of that. And so when we are setting the bar for our entire family, that yes, our, our feathers going to be ruffled, our anger is going to flare, our frustration is going to happen. Yes, because you're human. And you're especially going to get frustrated with your family because you have expectations for them. But if you know out the gate that we're all going to do it differently, we're all going to have our own pace, we're all going to have our different reactions, um, then it's going to make things a little easier. Um, and that's true for all, for all cases, but siblings are fascinating because they're the ones that point the fingers. You know, I've done lots of sibling support groups and they're like, well, so I'm worried about so-and-so because she is crying all the time. And then that cry, the crying one says, well, I'm worried about you because you never cry. And, <laughs> and there's this back and forth. And then, you know, it's just, and all it needs is conversation and communication. And so I think, you know, I love doing grief work because I think it, it, it's, we're fascinating creatures, aren't we? As human beings, we're just fascinating. Um, okay, awesome. So I want to kind of talk about, um, I want to talk about some practical ways, Brie. I've been trying all of our videos really hard to kind of wrap up with some very practical ideas for what we can be doing while we're grieving during this time. Um, so what ideas, what suggestions, what have, what is your family's doing? What are you telling families to do? One of my favorite suggestions, especially right now with, with COVID-19 and everything going on and the isolation, um, if you feel up to it, journal. Um, journal your grief, journal your day-to-day. -day. Um, if you have like a, an agenda book where you, or a schedule where you have space to write, sometimes just in the margin, sometimes just a sentence a day, or if you are particularly grieving, finding a note page and writing in how you're feeling and expressing, I think it's important to acknowledge all of the emotions we go through, especially right now um, with everything going on with isolation. Um, and I, and one of my, and if you're not a writer, um, journal without words, which is what I say, which is paint or draw or sketch something. Um, also drinking water. <laughs> I think drinking water can be very, cause especially if you are a crier, um, mm -hmm. it, it, you don't realize how fast you get dehydrated and, Certain, certain self-care when we're grieving goes to the wayside. So monitoring yourself, drinking water, trying to eat a balanced meal, um, going on little walks. If you have pets, that can be helpful too, taking a dog for a walk, um, 
pets also can be wonderful. If you don't have a pet, I'm not saying go out necessarily and adopt one, but if you're thinking about it, they can be some great companions and they can also uh, react really well with our grief. They, they can sense when, when you need a cuddle. Um, but I also think uh, also you can lean towards your families and, and ask for conversations, reach out to professionals, reach out to hospices, reach out to Talbot Hospice mm -hmm. um, and see how, if you needed someone just to talk to a more of an objective person than a sibling who doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. grieve the same way you do. Um, but also I think allow yourself to be vulnerable, um, to be sort of fragile, mm -hmm. um, but then also know that that doesn't mean that you are weak or that um, your grief isn't important and it, it is it is very, pow your grief is powerful and it's um, something that I think we all need to sort of experience and, and feel. Um, and then hopefully when we can rejoin um, and sort of get a, a sense of normalcy again, mm -hmm. quote unquote normalcy, um, maybe we can kind of come together and really, really hug those loved ones and really just spend some time talking and reminiscing and maybe even pulling out a journal or pulling out something you did. Um, if you love to read, pulling out a book that you read that you really thought was influential. Um, there's some great literature, especially about grief. Um, and to kind of pull that out and be like, I read this book. I think you would really like it. I think it's good to kind of have those discussions too. Um, yeah. I think those are all great tips, you know, and you touched on a lot of different things. We're not, you know, and I've said this in our videos before, and um, we're going to, we're going to start wrapping up, but um, is, you know, we don't just grieve our emotional selves, our, our entire being grieves. You know, we are all, we, our, our entire being is wired together. Our emotions, our brains, our, our, you know, our bodies, our muscles, you know, and however you typically handle stress are good ways to handle grief. You know, because grief can cause stress in our bodies. We, we hold tension. We don't eat right. We don't eat enough. We eat too much. We sleep too much. We sleep too little. Um, we can't think straight. You know, we, we've lost our keys again. And, you know, so grief is a full body, whole person experience. And so we, we focused on the emotions today. Um, but Brie touched on the physical aspect. Drink water. You know, take care of yourself. Go outside. Let the sun shine you know, touch your skin, um, you know, take care of yourself. Um, and, and, you know, grief, grief is a process. There's no finish line. There's no to-do list. If there was a to-do list, I would have made lots of money by now because I would have written a book. Um, but that's not how it works, right? We have to process. We have to let it come. You know, they, one of my favorite analogies for grief is, is waves. And I think living on the shore is so appropriate. And grief does, you know, sometimes it comes in like a little kind of you know, um, little wave that just hits our feet. And then other times it comes in like a tsunami and it just wipes us out. And both are normal and both are okay. And neither are a sign that something's wrong. Both are signs that you're human and that that's how, that's just how this is going to go. But as time goes on, you can find markers and milestones about that you're grieving appropriately, that, that you are pressing your grief. Are the waves not tsunamis anymore? Are they just kind of smaller? Um, when's the last time you cried? When's the last time you walked down the grocery store aisle and didn't, didn't tear up? You know, so there's different signs that we can look to. And journaling is one of my favorite too, Brie. Um, it's one of my favorite because if you are a, a self-reflecting kind of uh, personality, you can go back and read in those journals about how far you've come. And you can kind of see the mile markers within that journal that you might not have seen if you just kind of weren't documenting along the way. Um, so all very practical tips. Love this. Love working with Brianne. I think she's amazing. Um, so thank you for taking your time today and kind of doing this, um, this Facebook uh, live with me. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, we're, we're blessed. We're blessed to be able to have this platform to, to reach more people. Um, if you're watching this and you are not local to Talbot, most hospices have community-based bereavement programs. And so that's an easy Google search, um, finding community-based bereavement, bereavement services in your area. If you don't know how to look for that, email us and we would be more than happy to connect you and send you some things in your area. The beautiful thing about Facebook is it's, um, 
it's very broad and we get outside of our little pond every now and then. And, um, and Bree is connected to Coastal as well. So if you are in the lower shore and you want information on their free resources, um, and then I have some connections to Compass, who's the north of us. So you are not without resources if you want them. Um, so even though we are Talbot based, it does not mean that we cannot connect you to other places in your area. Um, so please don't hesitate to email us, put comments here on Facebook, check the videos out on YouTube. Um, we are very blessed. So thank you, Brianne, for being with me today and for doing this. And thank you guys for watching. Thank you for having me. All right. See you guys next week.